Stephen? Is it not working? Okay, good deal. I am not just not been talking loud enough or something. <laughs> Amen. All right. Take your Bibles tonight. Be turning. We got to First Samuel twenty-one. Uh, we ended uh, in First Samuel uh, twenty at verse forty-two. Was the last one I believe is where we stopped last week. I've been putting a note uh, that say stop, so I know where we quit at because we're going through this and uh, I'm going through several chapters. Seems like every Wednesday, but I'll try to get you out of here. I won't hold you too long, but I uh, want to try to get through, especially through, this is a pretty short chapter here in chapter 21. The last time we find David, and you can just remain seated tonight, but the last that we uh, ended up last week talking about David and Jonathan. Oh, uh, David, Jonathan was going to find out if his dad was, if Saul was intent on killing him and um, he found out the true character of his dad concerning David. Jonathan did. And really, uh, it was a sad meeting because I believe that was the last meeting uh, on this side of heaven that him and Jonathan had. We'll, we'll, we'll start reading. We'll read verse 42 at the last part of uh, 1 Samuel 20 here kind of as a little bit of a review. It says, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace for... As much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So that's where we ended up, I believe, last week. So we see here that Jonathan goes out and tells David, uh, Listen, Dad is going, he's trying to. Uh, to kill you, so you need to get out of town. So we find here, we'll find out here in verse uh, in chapter twenty-one, David left pretty much with just the clothes on his back. I mean, he didn't have time to go home and get provision. He didn't have time to go home and get his uh, weapons or anything that he had. He just took off. So it was apparently a pretty quick deal because Jonathan said, "Listen, you need to get, you need to get now." And then we'll find that here in, in chapter twenty or chapter twenty one as we start reading. Let's start reading uh, ver, uh, First Samuel twenty one verse number one. Let's pray uh, before we get started. Father, we thank you tonight for another opportunity to stand. And God, just ask you to bless this series as we continue to go through the life of David. And God, it's shown us a lot out of this and how we should conduct business in our own day and in our own lives. And God, I pray that we can use this as a model. Uh, for a lot of uh, a lot of our lives, uh, if not all of them, Lord, uh, some things that we can uh, maybe uh, warn us against, some stop signs, some things that we see in Saul's life that uh, we see where your grace is sufficient and it, your mercy does endure forever. How we see the stop signs for Saul throughout uh, this whole escapade, of him trying. Uh, to go against what you would have him to do, kill David, and he just keeps going deeper and deeper. And, Father, we pray that if nobody else, our young people get this, and that's what sin will do. It just gets worse and worse, and the and the weight gets heavier and heavier and heavier until if you go too far, there's no turning back. And, God, I pray that we don't allow that to happen in our lives, that we don't get so far off course and let Satan get from us so to the point that he takes us down that road. We love you. We praise you and thank you for all you do. Bless these for coming. Bless these for watching by Facebook tonight. And God, just uh, give us something for coming this way that we'll take with us. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. First number one says, Then came David to Nob, the, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the, at the meeting of David and said unto him, why art thou alone and no man with thee? He come to the priest unannounced. And when you've done that uh, or come in like that, the priest didn't know how to take it. He knew he was a servant of Saul and, and coming to him. But he knew David was also a warrior. And he thought, why are you coming in here uh, to me and coming unannounced? Because if this was something you was going in for a meeting or a sit-down or a conversion or whatever, uh, there would have been a messenger that would have come to let the priest know that hey, one of uh, the captain of the host is going to be here on such and such date, 
in the so because we know why David is fleeing, and he goes uh, to the best place he knew, and he went to get out of God. Amen. Uh, now, I, of course, we know that David was with the Lord at all, but he went to get what he needed uh, from this priest. And we'll find here uh, some things out of this that I want to show you that uh, a lot of people would have probably said, shame on David for what he did, but I'll show you that uh, God cares about his kids, and he wants to take care of them. He don't care about man's tradition, and he don't care about some of the things that we would get hung up on. But verse number 2 says, And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee. And what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now, we know that's not true. He tells Halimelech this, and we know why David had left and flee. So he said, I'm kind of on a private mission, if you will. And he tells the high priest, he said, so we don't want anybody to find out about why I'm here and why I came. So really and truly, if you look at it, David was telling a little white lie. I guess you could say, but you understand that when you're in fear for your life and you're doing everything you know to do, and David had to come up with an answer pretty quick, and I'm sure he's not going to tell the high priest that, hey, I'm fleeing from Saul because he's trying to kill me, because if he found that out, he might know that, uh, well, there's a reason he's trying to do that, and we need to get some information, because, see, they didn't have telephones and Facebook, things like that back then to spread this kind of information. So the high priest uh, don't even really realize at this time that there is a, 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 a tension between the king and David. So, or the, the way I take it, that he don't really know what's going on here. And, and David kind of tells him something just to kind of appease him and to kind of calm him down to let him know that, look, I'm not here for anything bad, but uh, I'm on a private mission is, is what the deal is. So anyway, uh, he says in verse number three, now therefore, what is under thine hand? He said, give me five loaves of bread in mine hand or what there is present. He said, uh, I, I need five loaves of bread, he said, or whatever you got. I don't care. He was hungry. And uh, he said, and his men that was with him that were in a certain place was hungry as well. Look here. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women, and David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about three days. Because that's all David could answer for. He knew how long they had been on the run, and I take it that they had been on the run here for three days and had not ate. So David tells him, I know for a fact for three days they've been clean, all right? And he said, since I came out and the vessels of the young men are holy and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So look here, verse 6. So the priest gave him hallowed bread. Man alive, I can't believe that he let him eat the church bread. Can you? I mean, there's a lot of people would look at that and say, well, shame on David. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe his stomach didn't cramp up and he start throwing up because he ate the Lord's bread. Listen to me. God wanted his young ones took care of, and, and a lot of people would get hung up on certain things. Now, I'm not taking away from what this was. Don't misunderstand me at all. But what I'm saying is there's things that man, tradition of man, traditions that man has, that he, they get so tore up about things that God sometimes don't care as much about. I remember that the Pharisees uh, would got tore up about them healing people on the Sabbath day, and Jesus told them, Listen, if somebody needs to be healed, would you not heal them? If there's an ox in the ditch, would you not pull it out? He, he told them, he said, listen, uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. And we get so hung up a lot of times on tradition, and we put all of our eggs in that basket and miss the very reason that God put us in position to do the things he called us to do to start with. Amen? Because why? We get hung up on tradition. I'm not very big on man's tradition. I don't know if you've realized that about me, but I just don't care that much about that. Now, I do honor tradition, and I think it's very important to do that, but I'm not going to put that and value that tradition over the truth of the Lord. Amen? 
We just can't do that. We have to go by the truth of this Bible more than man's tradition because uh, Jesus spoke about that. He said, he told the Pharisees, he said, you're full of dead man's bones. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you have no relationship. Amen. And that's being paraphrased, but that's what he said. He said, you're full of dead man's bones. Now you look the part. He said, you look churchy and you're keeping all the traditions perfect so everybody can see and make them think that you're doing right. He said, but I know the true tale about you. He said, I can see your heart. And on the inside of you, you're full of dead man's bones. So here's my question to you. Is it better to look the part or to live the part? Amen. To live it. I'd rather it be in my heart than be on the outside. I'd rather be a preacher in my heart than to look like one on the outside is what I'm trying to say. Hey, man, I've had people get torn up because I don't wear a suit and a tie and things like that. Is that not the silliest thing you ever seen? Hey, man, the boys was aggravating me because we married, um, uh, uh, um, I forgot their names, Stephen and Mercedes. Hey, man, that's about, I got too much. I got too much on my plate, hey, man. But we, we got done with the wedding the other day, and then the boys over there was ribbing me a little bit. And the preacher got on Facebook. He said, golly, keep us that around your neck. I said, you better keep that picture, brother, because that ain't going to be that long. That thing choked me to death. Amen. He said, I just could get a bigger shirt and a bigger tie, and it wouldn't have done me like that. Amen. But, but, but and we joke around about those things, and I know that y'all could care less to just like me. But I'm serious. There's some people, they get tore plumb, plumb out of the frame if a preacher comes in and he ain't got a three piece suit on his body. And I'm like, where in God's name have we got to with this thing? We're more concerned with what the preacher's got on than we are lost souls that are dying and going to hell out on the street. Hey, man, we get so tore up about stuff like that. And I just, to me, I laugh about those things because I think they're kind of trivial and kind of silly. But the thing about it is, and, and that's what we would see here. You'd have some people look at this and say, well, I can't believe David ate the hallowed bread. He ate the show bread and was telling lies to the high priest. Well, God apparently was okay with it because he didn't kill David right here. Amen. Anyway, that's just something to think about as we go through this. He said, uh, so the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul uh, was there that day. This is where it got messed up. It said, detained for the Lord, and his name was Doag, and Edomite, the chiefest herdman that belonged to Saul. Right here, right here, where uh, gossip and spreading things around about people will get things messed up. Because this guy, he's taking all this in, and he's going to run right back to Saul and tell what was going on. Look here. And David said unto Ahim Ahimelech, and is there not here under thine hand a spear or a sword? He said, For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. You ain't lying. He had to get out there. He was going to get killed. Amen. So he didn't even have time, as I said, to go home and get his weapon, his armor, or anything. Verse 9, And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, Behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. He said, If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it me. David said, You know what? I know that sword works. <laughs> Amen. That's the one I used to cut off Goliath's head with. So I'm going to take that one with me. Yeah, that's going to be good enough. I don't think David expected to have anything that good to be able to take as weaponry. That's like going in and asking for a slingshot and him giving you a bazooka. Amen. So David goes in, gets this sword. He said, Man, that's the, he said, Yeah, I'll take that. That'll be a good one right there. Because David knew that sword was was one that worked. Uh, verse number 10, it says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. 
And the servants of Achir said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another? him and dance is saying Saul hath slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Remember what got them in trouble to start with? That's Look how it spread about the land. And everybody got word of it. See and Saul he let this go to his head and it kept eating at him so it was everywhere. Amen. When these women wrote this song about it. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. He heard that, and he said the last time that song was sung, it sparked something in Saul and changed his attitude toward me. Look what David does. Listen, David wasn't just a good warrior. He was also a good actor. Hey, man, look here what he did. And it said in he, talking about David, and he changed his behavior before them. I thought this was pretty nifty what he did. He said, and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. He transformed himself into a crazy man. He, he heard that. He said, uh-oh. He said, this might not be a, a peace. A, a peace. This might not be no peace in this territory. So I better change the way I'm acting. Amen. So he acted like a madman. A crazy man. I don't know if he was doing it so they wouldn't recognize him or what the deal was or thinking, well, he's done lost his mind or whatever. But look here. So then said a kiss and took the servants low. You see, the man is mad. He said, wherefore then ye have ye brought him to me? He said, why'd you bring this crazy guy in here? He didn't even recognize him. He said, why'd you bring him in here? He said, who is this guy? He said, have I need of madmen? He said that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence. Shall this fellow come into my house? Amen. And this is where David wrote Psalm 34. We're not going to read it all, but I'll read the first verse. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. He said, my soul shall make her boast in, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Verse number 6 of Psalm 34 I want to read to you next is one of my favorite verses in all the Psalms. Listen to this. This is a good one. This poor man cried. Remember David was writing these Psalms and he was praying and he felt like God wasn't listening? Well, now I think he's had a change of heart and realized that God was on his side. He was escaping. He got provision for what he needed. He had nothing he brought from home. Now he got food, he got his belt full, and he's got a good sword on his side. He escaped a kiss or whatever right here. Psalm 34. Listen to this verse number 6 in Psalm 34. It says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Amen. So David has a change. Then he writes Psalm 56. He says, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Him, He fighting daily oppresseth me. So if you want to go back and read those, that is in between uh, right after uh, Psalm 21, verse number 15, is where he wrote Psalm 34 and Psalm 56. You can go back on your own study time and see uh, how these Psalms took place and why. It, it, it makes it really good to kind of put them in context and understand uh, the place that David wrote them. I mean, it makes a big difference for me uh, to understand because you'll just read through the Psalms. It looks like a big prayer list or whatever of him talking to God. But when you see what he's going through when he wrote them, it makes a lot more sense to you or it does to me. So he wrote uh, 34 and 56, and you can go back later and check on that. All right. Now let's start in First Samuel uh, 22 right here. First Samuel 22. Now, my Bible here jumps around. As I said, I'm reading this one out of chronological order, but you will be uh, 1 Samuel 22, verse number 1. I believe that's right. And at 15 was the last one of Psalm, or 1 Samuel 21, correct? All right. All right. 1 Samuel 22, verse number 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, 
they went down thither to him. Now, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse number 16 is right after this verse. It says, And there came of the children of Benjamin and Judah to the hold unto David. The people now, his people that are with him, are coming to him. They understand that there's a division now in the kingdom, I believe. And these guys are coming to say, hey, we're loyal to you, David. Amen. So I know this probably helped David. He writes the words of Psalm 142 right there, but we're not going to read that. And I'm going to jump into verse number two. Now, verse number two of, of Samuel, of 1 Samuel 22. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So we see here how David's following is beginning to build as leader or as king, so to speak. Now, as I said, in mine, throws in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse number 17 uh, and 18. I'll read it, and you don't have to turn over there. It says, And David went out to meet them, and answered, and said unto them, If ye be come peaceably unto me to help me, mine heart shall be knit unto you. But if ye be come to betray me to mine enemies, seeing there is no wrong in my hands, the God of our fathers, look thereon and rebuke it. He said, if you're here to betray me, you might as well turn around now. He said, but if you're for me, he said, we'll have a bond here. So David told him right up front, he said, God's going to find out about it, and God's going to rebuke it. Verse number 18 of 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Then the Spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, thine are we. David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers. For thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. And Psalm 141 was read. You see, it's jumping back and forth right here, but it's really good because it puts everything into order to help you to understand Psalm, or 1 Samuel 22 a little bit. All right, 1 Samuel now, we're getting back to where you all are at. Is 1 Samuel 22, verse number 3. Is that right? That's where we're at for you all now. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. But look here, he was concerned for his family. And he said, listen, until I find out what it is that God's want me to do, I want you all to be protected. See, he's worried about Saul because he knows now since Jonathan had found out what was going on, and David and and or David and Jonathan, uh, Jonathan come back and told David everything his father desired. Now Saul knows that the that the surprise is over. There's no way he's going to be able to sneak up on David. So I believe now what he's doing, he's bringing a. You'll see here in just a few minutes, but he's bringing a full fledged army after him now. Everybody that'll follow Saul, he's going after him with everything he's got to try to kill David. And David was concerned, and probably rightly so, concerned for his mom and dad and his family. And he said, hey, I'm going to move them to, to over here to Moab. Can you uh, let them stay here for a while? Uh, what, what was Moab? Remember that when we read the book of Ruth? The wash pot, God's wash pot. So who would go to Moab? Nobody. I believe that's why David sent them there, because he's thinking, oh, well, he broke tradition again. I can't believe David done such a thing. But you know what? He wanted his family protected. And he sent them down there. So and maybe that was why. But uh, it ended up working. Now, right after that, he wrote Psalm 64. All right, 1 Samuel 22, verse number 6. It says, When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in 
Gibeah under the tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Here now, you Benjamites. He says, Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Look here what he's doing. He's bargaining for their service. He said, What's he going to be able to give you? He said, is he going to give you all these fields and vineyards now that we know that he's going to be anointed and he's going to be the next king? He said, is he going to give you all this stuff? He said, and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. He said, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. He thinks that Jonathan, well, they did. Jonathan and him had this covenant, and he said, nobody told me. And I'm like, you, you still don't get it. You still don't get it. His mind is so messed up, you can see that. He said, there is none of you that is sorry for me. Ain't he? Now he's wanting a pity party. He thinks everybody ought to be controlled by his jealousy and all his. You know what? That's the way miserable people are. They want everybody else around them to be just as miserable as they are. And if you don't show enough compassion for their misery, then they sound like Saul does right here. And says, y'all don't even care. He said, I've made you captain over thousands and hundreds. Give you vineyards and fields. David ain't never give you none of that stuff. And nobody even told me about it. John, well, big dummy, if you think about it, you'd know they had a covenant because when their eyes met in 1 Samuel 18, it was in front of you when they made the covenant. So they knew they was dear friends before all this ever conspired. But see how your mind gets messed up on sin? How sin, what it does to you, and it will control you? He, he's justifying this in his mind. He said, sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. He's saying, now David's out there waiting on me to come in and, and kill me. Like he's lying in wait. You see what it's doing to his brain? Verse number nine, then answered Doeg. The Edomite. Remember, he was the one that was there at Elimelech. Look here what he did. He could not wait, could not wait to get back and tell Saul. He's like, oh, I'm going to be, I know the way a tattletale is. First one to run up. Oh, I got some news that you're going to want to hear, Saul. Thinking it's going to help him in some way. Look here. Then answered Doag, the Edomite, which was said over the servants of Saul and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, and Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, Ahitub. He said, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech, uh, the, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priest that were in Nob. And they came all them to the king. Now, I'm going to show you what sin will do, how far down it will run you. Look at this. And Saul said, Here now, thy son of Ahitub. He said, And he answered, Here am I, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why, ha why, have, that, why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse? And the son of Jesse, and that they, and that thou that hast given him bread and a sword, hast inquired of God for him. He should rise against me to lie in wait at this day. Did you catch what he said? He said, and inquire of God against me. Well, if God's against you, don't you think it's you that ought to straighten up? Look how messed up. It's unbelievable to me as we read this to see how messed up somebody can get. But that goes to show you, ladies and gentlemen, what sin will do if you don't get a hold on it. It says, Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all the servants as David? He said, Which is the king's son-in-law? There, I believe, ding, ding, there's another warning sign trying to get across to Saul. He said, you don't have another servant that's as faithful as him. What are you talking about? He is even your son-in-law. Think about what you're doing. You know what I believe that is? I believe that's another stop sign for God. See what God's doing? He's trying to put people in his path and saying, son, you're going off the deep end. You better, you better listen. Look here. He says, and goeth at thy bidding and is honorable in thine house. 
Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, lest for more. See, I told you, that high priest had no idea. He just knew David come unannounced, and it seemed a little funny. But when David told him, hey, David was an honorable man. He had no reason to doubt what he said. He said, I, I didn't know. I don't even know what you're talking about. I have not, but see, the king thinks everybody that's not right with him is conspiring against him because of something he dreamed up in his own mind. The king's not listening. He's not hearing none of this. Look here. And the king said, thou shalt surely die. Okay, now you're going to kill a priest. No, no, we're going to go worse than that. Look here. Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, turn Look here, and slay the priest of the Lord. He didn't even say slay the priest. He said, hey, guys, talking to his servants, he said the footman and his shoulders that were with him. The king gives a command. Now, look, check this out. He says, kill the, kill the priest of the Lord. He's so messed up. He even says that he's of the Lord. He said, because their hand also is with David and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. They had more sense than the king had. They said, listen, here's what I believe was going on there. They said, we've stuck by you through all this craziness. But king, you're going too far now. This is way too far. You are going off the deep end, and I am not going to kill one of God's men. And I believe that's what they did. And they stood the ground. Look here. And the king said to Doeg, Ah, oh, the little tattletale, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear the linen ephod. He killed everybody in God's house. Everybody. The little tattletale. You know what? Here's the thing. When you're that kind of person, you'll do some crazy stuff. And Saul said, if I can get them to do it, the little tattletale that could not wait, come give me the news about David being there, he'll do what I want him to do. So now look what he's done. Killed all them priests and all the men of God. What a shame. And Nob, the city of the high priest, smote he, well, listen to this, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and suckling and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. He wiped out the whole village because the priest that had no ill will against Saul give provision to David. And he goes and wipes out him and all the men of God and all the other priests that were there. Four score, what would that be? Four score would be 85 people. 85 men of God, they sit there and slew. Unarmed priest. Because they remember David said, What's under the line hand? He said, all we got's the sword of Goliath. They didn't have no, they, they, they killed unarmed men. Let that sink in. Understand what, what sin will do. How far, how far off the deep end. I mean, I love, I, I don't love it, but it's amazing to me that Saul said, uh, I want you to kill the priest of the Lord. Because he's conspired against me today. He didn't just listen. Why would the priest lie to him? He didn't just listen to what Saul said to him. He just said, listen, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, David, come down. He said, I have no idea what you're saying. No more, no less. I have, this, the first I've heard of is what he said. So Saul didn't even listen to that. He said, I want you to kill him. The footman said, no. <laughs> uh, I'm not killing what you, you're going off the deep the warning sign, by the way. Now, here's what I think. This was it for Saul. After this, he, he went too far. He went too far. All right, after that, this is where Psalm 35 come in. Just a few verses, and I'm going to let you go. We're not going to read it, but Psalm 35 falls in right there. David said in the first verse of that, he says, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. It's really bad, man. It's really got bad right there. That's all Psalm 35. Now, your all falls into 1 Samuel 23 right here, right? 
Is that where we'd be next on your house? Let me see. I have to ask you because I ain't got my other Bible with me in this one. Verse 19, that's the last verse of Samuel, 1 Samuel 22, right? Okay, I'm missing one there. Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Verse what? Verse. All right, hold up. Let me find where I'm at. Verse 19. Well, girls, let me borrow your Bible. One of you. I I'll do that. It's chronological order. I lost my spot. Okay. Verse 19 and up. All right, verse number 20. 1 Samuel. All right. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Atab, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. That's where we was going next, right? In your house? Okay. And Abiathar showed David Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doag the Edomite was there. You know what? People like that stand out. People like that stand out, I believe. He said, I knew that day when I was there, he was going to run and tell Saul what was going on. So the Edomite was there. He said that he would surely tell Saul. He said, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life. But with me thou shalt be safeguard. Boy, I like that. Hey, David said, listen, I believe he's getting, he, he, he's over it now. Now he's in fighting mode. He said, don't worry. He said, because the one that's seeking me, he said, if he killed the priest and the priest had nothing to do with it, the one that's surely turned for me, he's going to kill you. So if he's after me, he's after you. But you stay with me and you'll be safe. Amen. You'll be in safeguard. All right. Now we'll pick up in chapter 23 next week. I lost that last night in my Bible. Oh, that's what it was. My Bible, or this, this chronological order Bible, read verse number 1 of chapter 23 before verse number 20. I don't know why they did that. But anyway, the verse, uh, we'll, we'll pick up right there next week. That's what messed me up. Then it went on to verse number 20. But anyway, you see how, how off the deep end that, that people can get when they, when they let sin come in? I mean, Saul, when, if, you, if you'd have looked at Saul, we're, we're looking at the life of David, but the life of Saul uh, intertwines it so much that really we're looking at both of them, which is really good. You get killed two birds with one stone. But Saul wasn't like this early on. Saul was a good man. You remember the Bible said that Samuel wept all night long when he heard Saul had sinned? He wept all night. Why? Because Saul wasn't like that. But understand this. You listen to me. That's what sin can do. It can turn you into somebody that you wouldn't even think you're capable of being if you allow it to stay too long. That's what Satan can do to somebody. It can, it can creep in and cause you to be something, do something that you would never have done any other time before. It's sad to see what Saul turned into there. But we'll pick up in chapter 23. Next week. Let's bow our heads.